existing prohibitions at the time, in 1822, the first American translation of the Latin Missal was published by Bishop John England of Charleston. We refer to that Missal because it enjoyed broad use among Catholic faithful throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. Bishop England carefully explains why Latin is used as the language of the Mass in terms we can all understand. The doctrine of the Church is essentially unchangeable, hence a dead language which is subject to no change as to the meaning of its expressions is far better calculated to preserve it unchangeably than modern languages which are perpetually varying. Not until 1877 did Blessed Pope Pius IX allow any bishop to authorize layman's missals, and Pope Leo XIII later put them on the ordinary imprimatur basis. But let's get back to Rosmini, who understood this point very well. Both a priest and recognized philosopher, Rosmini makes it clear that changing the language of the liturgy to the common language of the people is not the answer. He writes, I have not enumerated all the advantages of ancient languages, nor the, all the disadvantages of modern languages. But what I have said is sufficient to show conclusively that the damage caused by the separation of clergy from people in the sacred services cannot be remedied by introducing new languages into the churches. The use of these languages in place of those consecrated by centuries would imply a cure worse than the disease. And that brings us to a most interesting detail. The work which we have cited here, The Five Wounds of Christ, was one of the two Rosmini books which were placed on the Index of Forbidden Books in 1849, three years after Our Lady's apparition at La Salette. Rosmini died in 1855, and in 87 the Holy Office Decree Post Obitum condemned 40 propositions taken from Rosmini's works. Well over a hundred years later, Pope Paul VI would refer to Rosmini's works as prophetic, and Pope John Paul II would recall Rosmini's works in his own encyclical, Fides et Ratio. And not without reason, for in the reading of Rosmini, in works written at about the same time the Blessed Mother was appearing to St. Catherine Labore at the Rudebach, one discovers a virtual blueprint for the Second Vatican Council. Only on July 1, 2001, was Antonio Rosmini rehabilitated by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. At about the same time Antonio Rosmini was gaining notoriety in the beautiful lake region of northern Italy, basically between 1830 and 1850, Dom Prosper Garanger was beginning his life's work of restoring the great monastery of Salem and the sacred liturgy in France both of which had fallen on hard times. The work of restoring the structure of the monastery would serve to be a far simpler task than restoring the beauty and majesty of the Divine Liturgy. But through his efforts, Garanger, who died in 1875, became the father of what would come to be known as the liturgical movement. Dom Garanger from France and Dom Rosmini from Italy both observed a breakdown of Catholic life in their lifetime and tried to find a remedy, one which they could be sure would work. The primary focus of both was a return to the sacraments, although Rosmini looked for an answer in a radically different way than did Garanger. Rosmini looked to close the gap between the priest and the people by bringing them closer to the priest, and in the process the lines between the two became somewhat blurred. Garanger's remedy was to reform the liturgy by returning to the splendor and majesty of the worship of the church when the civilized world was Catholic, the Middle Ages. Garanger was faced with a monumental challenge in his effort to reform the liturgy. In France, in the years following the Concordat, Catholic liturgy was in disarray. According to Dom Rousseau in his book on the liturgical movement of the 19th century, the progress of the liturgy, in dioceses such as Versailles and Bouvet, there were as many as nine breveries and missals in regular use. Some were written with a Jansenist or Gallican view, but all vied with one another in their originality and suggested changes to the Mass. In 
And although the liturgical movement of Dom Guéranger spread gradually across the continent, in many cases it encountered considerable resistance. To cite but one example, in Germany, Karl Anton Winter, a professor at the universities of Ingolstadt and Landshut, even before 1820, introduced a proposal for a German mass and ritual that drew many supporters. Their objective sounds familiar to us today, but was apparently a new idea to them. To simplify the mass, to give it more of a social character, and to make it more intelligible and edifying. In England, the liturgical movement drew the attention of Pusey and Newman, who long before converting to Catholicism, attempted to reinvigorate the Anglican liturgy through what became known as the Ritualist Movement. This little bit of the history of the liturgical movement may be helpful to those Catholics who previously had no idea of the tension that surrounds authentic liturgy. For there are always those attempting to preserve what works and those who want to change it because they are confident they know better. But after what we have seen, one thing seems certain. The new mass of Paul VI is not near as new as most of us were led to believe. That brings us to the beginning of the 20th century. In order that we might be able to put all of this information into a proper perspective, let me read to you two citations. The first of these is taken from the most recent issue of a Catholic fortnightly, which claims to be the strongest voice in traditional Catholicism today. In a recent article opposing the agreement that was struck between Bishop Rangel of the Society of St. John Vianney in Campos, Brazil and the Holy See, its editor writes, Combating the errors of neo-modernists today is impossible without unequivocally admitting that the Council and its brainchild, the Novus Ordo Misse, were catastrophic prudential errors. Now let me read you another citation. He was convinced that the liturgy could be a helpful means of Christian restoration, provided the people were given the opportunity of truly participating in the Mass at which they now only assist. Stressing the social character of the Holy Sacrifice, he strove to make assistance at Mass a community action. His chief concern was to unite the people as closely as possible with the priests. It pained him to see how those assisting at Mass were left to themselves, each one seeking his own edification in his own way. He was opposed to the singing of hymns or reciting the rosary during liturgical functions. He objected to anything that separated the people from the great action. He wanted everyone present to sing the ordinary. He favored a restoration of communion under both species. He looked down on private Masses and thought that the holy sacrifice should be offered only when the people participate through sacramental communion. He thought public communal confessions should replace private ones. He advocated the suppression of priestly celibacy, held a dim view of veneration of Our Lady and the Saints, spoke negatively regarding papal authority, popular devotions, and pilgrimages, and he advocated that the Mass be celebrated in the vernacular. While this may well sound as though it might have been said by any of a number of ultra-progressivist liturgical experts who threw his weight behind a radical Second Vatican Council, this information is taken from Dom Rousseau's The Progress of the Liturgy. And the he referred to here is J.B. Hersher, a prominent theologian and one of the founders of the University of Tübingen, Cardinal Ratzinger's turf. These proposals suggested by Hersher, however, were published in the 1820s. And though each of them would come to fruition after 1960, these ideas, which merely reiterate those of the Protestants and Jansenists before him, were hardly the brainchild of the Second Vatican Council. Herscher died in 1865, a hundred years before the Second Vatican Council ended. I realize we have presented here an abundance of historical minutia. But if one is to understand the truth of the introduction of Pope Paul VI Mass, then some of this history is essential. As becomes blatantly obvious, at the dawning of the 20th century, 
there was a polarization regarding the liturgy into two particular camps. Both camps recognized a crisis of faith in the church that had resulted from two revolutions. First, the Protestant Revolution that directly attacked the church, and second, the French Revolution, the Enlightenment, which attacked God himself. Both camps wished most sincerely to restore the church. They just disagreed on the method. On the one hand were the progressivists, those who shared some or all of the thinking of Winter, Herscher, Jansen, and in part Ross Meany and the progressivists who followed him. They pushed ever more strongly for the simplification of the Mass, for the Mass to be said in the vernacular, for the priest to turn and face the people, for communion under both species, for a married clergy, for less individualistic piety, which they came to think of as Protestant, for changes in the art and architecture of the physical structures which would remove distractive elements and make them more accessible to communal involvement. They also advocated the inclusion of popular music and liturgy. And they were confident that if these modifications were embraced by everyone, the Catholic Church would be renewed. The other side, supported by Dom Guéringer and subsequently by Dom Baudouin, until his incursion into an ecumenical experiment, pushed for a return to the sacred, to the great liturgical era of the Middle Ages. They were certain that the faithful would most benefit from the beauty, pageantry, splendor, mystery, and intense piety of the traditional liturgy. One could say that there was a third party in all of this, the, the undecided, those priests, monks, and theologians who had not yet chosen sides but continued to exercise their respective ministries to the best of their abilities. These were fair game for whomever in the other two camps might be able to forward the most convincing argument. As the 20th century dawned, that was the situation, and although the first pope to be elected in the 20th century clearly fell on the side of Dom Guéringer, the papacy of Pope St. Pius X would serve to be a turning point in liturgical wars. Within three months of his election in 1903, St. Pius X issued a motu proprio, Trale Solicitundini, to address many of these very issues. The great Pope condemned the introduction of profane music in the liturgy and the individual abuses that were becoming more and more widespread. He called for the removal of banal art which had become commonplace in the churches, and ordered the return of beauty in both art and architecture which would reflect authentic Catholic thought. He then called on the bishops to bring the faithful in their care to an understanding and proper appreciation of the sacred music of the church, particularly the ancient chant, that in this way they might more thoroughly embrace the liturgy to the depths of their being. The sainted Pope wanted nothing more than sacred liturgy that would positively affect the faithful in their pews. So who won this battle between the progressivists and the traditionalists? But how did it happen? How did they overcome their traditional opponents when, to all appearances, those who supported the traditional position were in power? The first thing that occurred, which began to tip the scales, was the hijacking of St. Pius X's motu proprio on the liturgy. Whereas he specifically called for a participation of the faithful in traditional plain chant, which he was convinced would enable them to more thoroughly embrace the beauty and mystery of the sacred liturgy, the progressivists co-opted his intent and misrepresented his words in a way which falsely represents that the Pope wished for a participation by the faithful that was active, as in physical involvement. Certainly this was neither what the Pope said nor what he meant. The misrepresentation of the Pope's remarks, which the progressivists then claimed was a call to active participation in the liturgy by all the faithful, was a clever blow and one from which the Church continues to reel today, almost a hundred years later. For it is in the name of active participation that the bulk of the changes promoted and experimented with for over 300 years have been incorporated into Catholic liturgy in the new Mass. I don't wish to belabor the point, but there is one aspect of the matter of participation which turns out to be the leading issue. Call it the point man in this charge to change the liturgy. 
That is the introduction of the layman's missal, which set the stage during the pontificate of St. Pius X for the innovative and experimental dialogue mass, the first giant step toward Pope Paul VI mass. The dialogue mass was introduced illicitly prior to World War I and spread throughout Europe and subsequently to the United States because it was immediately adapted by the military chaplains. The same technique would be used throughout the 20th century to attempt to force acceptance to other illicit practices. Communion in the hand, communion under both species, and altar girls are just some familiar examples. In the early years of the 20th century, progressivists proposed, as had the Jansenists, Rasmini, and virtually every other liturgical progressivist, that if the faithful had access to a missal, the Mass would become more meaningful. And recall, the translation of the Mass into vernacular had been prohibited by the Church, a condemnation with the strongest censures attached until 1877. Would the introduction of a layman's missal and ultimately the dialogue mass do what the progressivists proposed? Certainly the church had never believed it would. St. Leonard of Port Maurice, the great Franciscan preacher who brought tens of thousands of Calvinists back into the church, wrote extensively on the mass. In The Hidden Treasure, Holy Mass, St. Leonard defines three basic levels of assisting at Mass, beginning with what he perceives as the least effective. The first method of hearing Holy Mass is used by those who, book in hand, accompany with the utmost attention all the actions of the priest, and thus pass the whole of the Mass reading. The second method of hearing Holy Mass is that employed by those who dispense with books, who read nothing whatsoever during the time of the divine sacrifice, but fixing their mental eye, kindled by faith on Jesus crucified, and leaning against the tree of the cross, gather its fruits in sweet contemplation, pass the whole of the time in devout interior recollection, and sweetly engage their minds in consideration of those mysteries of the passion of Jesus which are not only represented, but are mystically carried out in that holy sacrifice. There is no doubt that this mode of hearing Mass is much more profitable than the first, as well as more sweet and attractive. The third method St. Leonard proposes is a combination of the two above, which uses some red prayers, although not those of the Missal, but prayers specific to the four ends of prayer, that is, praise, contrition, petition, and thanksgiving. St. Peter Julian Emard who lived in the 19th century and was known as the Apostle of the Eucharist, proposed several methods of hearing Mass which he considered superlative. None involved the use of a missal. And recall Bishop John England, who published the first American Missal. In his defense of the Latin language, he points out, the Mass is not a common prayer, but an act of sacrifice, in which by the ministry of the priest, God does acts beneficial to the people. In other words, prior to 1877, the church had officially forbidden the use of layman's missiles, and many saints throughout the life of the church certainly provided a great deal of insight into ways through which the faithful might most effectively participate in the Mass, and it was not through the use of a missile. Why then, and not only from the progressivists, but even from those who followed in the footsteps of Guerinjay, was there such a push for vernacular missiles to be made use of at every Mass? It is an interesting question, and even more so is it interesting because the demand for the use of the missile at Mass by every layman is about the only issue on which the progressivists and traditionalists agreed. You don't suppose that the use of the Missal by laymen at Mass might have been considered a stepping stone to something else, do you? Let me say that it is tempting at this point to provide a great deal more detailed historical information on liturgical movement. But for our purposes here, there's far more information than there is time to complete this video. And let's face it, most of the individuals who formed the core of the liturgical movement over the past two centuries, and particularly in the 20th century, are people whose names are 
unfamiliar to all but those who have an intense interest in matters liturgical. Suffice it to say for our purposes here that the movement that Dom Guerin J. began spread across Europe and found its home in the monasteries of the Benedictines and the houses of the Jesuits and other monastics who, for their part, wanted to get as much from the sacred liturgy as was possible. And following the death of Dom Guerin J., from Merid Sue to Maria Locke under the leadership of Abbot Marmion, to the experimentally ecumenical abbey established by Dom Baudouin, the progressivist liturgical movement became firmly entrenched behind the scenes of Catholic life. Looking merely, however, at the liturgical movement at the onset of the 20th century, without considering the incredible sociological changes that were occurring at the same time, would leave the picture incomplete. By the beginning of the 20th century, the second industrial revolution in the West was yielding to unprecedented changes in civilization. By the tens of thousands, immigrants were crossing oceans to settle in America. In Europe, as well as in the United States, factory work and, in particular, assembly line manufacturing drew vast numbers of people into urban settings. Electricity would quickly become readily available. The automobile would bring a population that had become increasingly mobile through locomotion to people who traveled to wherever it was they could find work. In all of this, the church, in the person of local bishops and priests, had to figure out how to adjust to the constantly changing social structure in a way that kept the faith alive to Catholics in their charge. It must not have been easy, and certainly one cannot challenge the zeal for the faith and care for souls that must have been uppermost in the minds of those concerned clerics. They were faced with tough questions. What could be done? What must be done in order that the Catholic faith remain alive? How could the faith be spread when the difficulty of taking care of those already in the church was overwhelming? Tough questions indeed, but somewhere along the way, somewhere between finding a way to make sure the faith remained alive and bringing new members into the flock, innovative ways of thinking led to experimentation, novelty, and unapproved practices of worship. By 1907, when Pope St. Pius X published the encyclical Pascendi Dominici Gregis, those he called the partisans of error were firmly entrenched. When the Holy Father warned of those who lay the axe not to the branches and shoots, but to the very root, that is, to the faith and its deepest fibers, about whom do you think he was referring? Clearly His Holiness was not referring to enemies at the gates but to those who had long since infiltrated the church and were spreading their poison from within. But by this time, by 1907, the battle was already lost. It was only a matter of time until the victors would claim their prize. Subsequent to Pope Pius X's motu proprio in 1903, the liturgical movement took root in European monasticism. In 1909, a congress of forward-thinking monastics was held at Mechlin, and in 1910, the first of many liturgical weeks, where parish priests were invited to spend a week at the monastery with the monks, was held at Mount Caesar near Louvain. Here they were inculcated with the agenda of the liturgical movement and the importance of full participation of the faithful in liturgy. Dom Boudouin had been the first to figure out this seminar system of educating parish priests, and the liturgical movement spread quickly across all of Europe and into the United States, finding its home in places such as the Benedictine Abbey at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, which served as its headquarters in this country for the bulk of the 20th century. As the 20th century progressed, the names of the liturgically progressivist leaders are less important than previously because the system that propelled the movement was so firmly entrenched and the agenda so clearly marked out that individual leaders would not impact the movement as they had in the past. There are incidents along the way that are important in the overall scheme of things, such as the numerous occasions when Popes Pius X Benedict XV and Pius XI granted indults for various groups to say Mass in the vernacular. 
St. Pius X had given permission for a sector of Yugoslavia to use the Roman rite in the Palaislav language. Benedict XV granted use of Croatian, Slovenian, and Palaislav on five occasions and in nine different places. In Germany, a regional version of the Missal was approved for Bavaria, and in 1935, the Vienna ritual for use in all of Austria was approved by Rome. And Christmas Eve 1943 brought from the Sacred Congregation of Rites a decree that a largely vernacular form of the Dialogue Mass, which some described as the German High Mass, was declared officially tolerated with the consent of the Holy Father, Pope Pius XII. While it would be unfair to say that it was a common practice, it appears that more requests of that nature were approved than disapproved. In the 1920s, there was a strong current toward interfaith prayer gatherings and conventions that were spawned by the growing and ever more powerful, actually by then the most powerful part of the movement, the progressivist faction. As a response, on January 26, 1928, Pope Pius XI published Mortalium Animos in an effort to bring a halt to the practice he said was doomed to fail because it betrayed the Catholic faith. We turn our attention now to the period following the Second World War, that which immediately preceded the Second Vatican Council. By the end of the Second World War, the liturgical movement was so firmly entrenched throughout the Latin Rite of the Church that it can fairly be said to have been pervasive. Nor was it underground, although the faithful in the pew were clueless because the liturgy was not something with which they had any reason to be concerned. The Mass was the Mass. It was, as the Catechism described, one throughout the world. It was a clear sign of the mark of the Church, the oneness of the Latin liturgy. However, in order that we might understand just how far the liturgical progressivists had traversed, consider this book, The Mass of the Future. First, think for a moment about that title, The Mass of the Future. Considering that there had been one Mass in the Roman Rite for almost 2,000 years, how could there be a Mass of the Future? And who could have thought there was going to be in 1948 when this book was published? The author, Jesuit Gerald Ellard, was a mover and shaker within the liturgical movement. And this book, his second on the subject, provides a summary of the activities that led to the advanced position of the movement at the end of the Second World War. And it foretold in a remarkable way the direction the movement would be taking. Well, let's take a look at what the mass of the future looked like in 1948. As far as Ellard was concerned that there was going to be a new mass was a given. When developing his prognostications as to what the mass of the future would look like, he focuses on almost a dozen specifics. First, the title of the chapter addressed to this issue is Wanted, Name for the New Mass. He proposes, if Holy Mass is to become a social function in which all share organically, or rather, let us say, before Holy Mass can occupy that position, it demands some modernization in popular terminology. At present, it suffers the needless handicap of an archaic nomenclature. And for those who don't speak liturgies, that means that the name of the Mass has to be replaced. After a couple of pages in which he proposes that the faithful in the pew do not understand the concept anyway, he proposes a suggestion that the term sacrifice be given a ten-year moratorium, and that in the interval this sacred action be described and spoken of as Holy Mass, the perfect profession of love. Nor is this a new idea. Listen to Martin Luther's words regarding the same issue which he wrote about the same time he was preparing his own worship service. When we have overthrown the Mass, we shall have overthrown the whole papacy with it. For it is upon the Mass, as upon a rock, that the papacy rests, with its monasteries, its bishoprics, its colleges, its altars, its ministers, and its doctrine. All these will fall when their sacrilegious and abominable Mass has crumbled into the dust. Yet, in order to achieve this aim successfully and safely, 
it will be necessary to preserve some of the ceremonies of the ancient Mass for the weak-minded who might be scandalized by too sudden a change. We must state in the first place that our intention has never been to abolish divine worship, but to purge the form of all additions which have sullied it. I am speaking of that abominable canon, which is a confluence of slimy lagoons. They have made of the Mass a sacrifice. They have added to it offertories. The Mass is not a sacrifice. It is not the act of a sacrificing high priest. Let us regard it as a sacrament or a testament. Let's call it a blessing or Eucharist or Lord's Table or Lord's Supper or the Memorial of the Lord. Or give it any title we like, provided that it is not sullied by the terms sacrifice or reenactment. Second, recognizing the Holy See's increasingly permissive attitude toward the vernacular, Ellard appears bold when he foresees both a new council, which he anticipates as being a continuation of Vatican I, and a change in the language of the Mass. He writes, The most sweeping conciliar change in this matter is the recommendation that certain parts of the Mass be given bilingual freedom. Listen to the tone of what he writes. The new missiles to be provided are to be bilingual in part, so that, at the celebrant's option, the designated parts may be in the inherited Latin or in a Rome-approved vernacular version. Third, Ellard here deals with streamlining the Mass and proposes new epistle and gospel readings, that the people pray the Our Father with the priest, that the second confidior before communion be eliminated, and that the people stand in certain places where kneeling was required formerly. Among other rubrical changes, the Ite Missa Est would be moved so that it would follow the last gospel. Even the ultra-progressivists, it seems, could not imagine that the last gospel would be dropped completely. Ellard's fourth proposal deals with the reorientation of the altar and reconfiguration of the worship space. Shown here is a picture of what would have been considered in 1945 a traditional arrangement of the altar in the apse of the church. Here is the new design, with a freestanding altar arrangement with the choir behind the altar and stalls and seats on the sides. It is in this section where Father Ellard mentions this church, St. Mark's in Burlington, Vermont. Notice that it has what Ellard calls a two-sided altar, so that Mass might be said either and notice the language he uses, with the priest facing away from the people, while from the other approach he finds himself celebrating in the older, other manner of facing towards them. He goes on to say that low mass, especially if it is a dialogue mass, gains enormously in the proximity and intimacy of the versus populum setting. In this chapter of the book, Eller quotes two bishops Archbishop Felton of Bordeaux and Bishop Raymond of Nice, who as early as 1945 publicly favored both the priests facing the people in Mass and the use of the vernacular. And remember, this is 1945, not 1965. Ellard's fifth proposal addresses the music of worship and insists that traditional plain song both be sung by all who are at Mass and that all liturgical music be translated into the vernacular. The sixth proposal brought forward is that of the offertory procession. Ellard provides examples with pictures of where, even in the early 1940s, the offertory procession was in steady use. That it would become a standard practice was not even a question to Ellard as early as 1942. Next, the author deals with what must have seemed at the time a complex matter deviations in the Mass to accommodate various occupations, ages, classes, etc. Again, almost 20 years before Vatican II, it would seem difficult to imagine that a vernacular Mass with the choice of dozens of Eucharistic prayers was even remotely possible. Ellard then goes on to deal with what he refers to as conventional Masses, meaning Masses being offered when great numbers of people are present, as at a convention. His proposal is, of course, concelebrated masses, and he concludes by quoting Cardinal Glennon that 
This is not an innovation, but a restoration. Ellard's last points are, first, that because the Holy Mass benefits the living, it should be offered for the living, not for the dead. And he strongly indicates that the Requiem Mass will be done away with. Second, that the prohibition against evening Masses on a regular basis be removed. Clearly, this provision in the planning of the liturgical movement progressivists made possible the anticipatory Mass on Saturday evening that fulfills the Sunday obligation in every Novus Ordo parish. A mere 14 years after the publication of The Mass of the Future, the Second Vatican Council Fathers would unanimously approve the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacro Sanctum Concilium. And in so doing, as impossible as it may have seemed prior to 1960, that approval of the bishops put each and every item that was on the wish list of the liturgical progressivists on the fast track to implementation. As Father Ralph Wilchin so capably illustrates in his book, The Rhine Flows Into the Tiber, this unlikely scenario became reality only because of the efforts of highly motivated progressivists whose well-organized and predetermined agenda was foisted upon the rest of the Council Fathers in a deft and well-orchestrated takeover of the Council at its onset. We said earlier that the new Mass was introduced because Certain people convinced that there was a better way of offering Mass, one that would be more beneficial to the Catholic faithful in the pew, gained the ear of the most prominent churchmen of the day. Those certain people who led the way from Ellard's seemingly far-flung proposals of 1948 to their actual fulfillment in 1969 are familiar names. Rahner, Schillebeeks, Kung, to name but a few. And it is clear that these powerful experts gained the ear of the Council Fathers because the Constitution on the Liturgy, in what turns out to be an irony of history, passed by a vote of 2,159 to 19. And it was passed on the 60th anniversary of Trale Solicitondini, Pope St. Pius X's motto proprio, the hijacking of which had jump-started the radical liturgical movement at the beginning of the 20th century. The closing of the Second Vatican Council was held on December 8, 1965. In an interview with the editor of Inside the Vatican magazine, one of the members of Archbishop Bonini's Concilium stated that the new Mass was completed and on the desk of Pope Paul VI in 1966, only a matter of months after the Council ended. In 1967, the new Mass was presented at the Synod of Bishops in Rome, and when they were asked for their approval, they withheld it. In fact, they rejected the new Mass. Subsequent to that rejection, the Protestant advisors were brought in and asked what, if anything, they found offensive in the new Mass. They had no objections. In May of 1969, despite both the prior rejection of the bishops and mounting opposition from high-ranking members of the Curia, including the head of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, Pope Paul VI introduced his Missali Romanum, declaring that it would be put into general use on the first Sunday of Advent that year. Why do we have two Masses in the Latin Rite of the Roman Catholic Church when for over 15 centuries there was only one? How did it happen? Why did it happen? And why did it happen when it did happen? I hope that we have answered those questions to your satisfaction. The remaining question, where do we go from here, is a different matter. The tremendous push to change the Mass has advanced across the past four centuries despite numerous and frequent condemnations by popes. First it was the push to get a missile into the hands of each person in church. Next came the dialogue mass, then the vernacular mass in various places, then the offertory procession, then the priest offering the mass versus populum, facing the people. And all of this many decades before the Second Vatican Council. After the Council, in addition to the introduction of a new rite of the Mass, which even the Pope who introduced it called innovative, shocking, and novel, similar illegal activities 
pushed for the eventual approval of communion in the hand, Eucharistic ministers, communion under both kinds, altar girls, and liturgical dance. Where does the church and the church's liturgy go from here? Well, from all appearances, the innovation and novelty does not appear about to abate anytime soon. So your guess is easily as good as mine. Legum credendi lex statuit supplicandi. Indeed, the law of worship does set the law of faith. And just as surely, people do worship as they believe. When considering the changes in the church over the past 40 years, and the effect those changes have had on the faithful, it is always tempting to demonize those we feel may be responsible to pick a fall guy, whether he be Pope Paul VI or Archbishop Bonini, or even the whole Second Vatican Council, and lay both responsibility and blame on them. Were it only so simple. In the research we have undertaken in order to complete this presentation, we too were looking for someone whose feet we could hold to the fire in this matter. But that individual does not exist. What we discovered for the most part were priests and bishops, good men, often holy men who were concerned to see the faith wane in the faithful in their care. Men like Antonio Rosmini, a holy priest who may one day even be canonized. These considered the problems that faced them and they proposed solutions. And in spite of the church's consistent condemnations of almost all of their proposals across the centuries, there came a time when the proponents of these solutions finally gained ascendancy in the church and it gained ascendancy in the person of Pope Paul VI. He rejected the solution that had been put forth by Garen Jay and the authentic liturgical movement and merely ratified the proposals put forth across the centuries by the Jansenists and the Gallicans, by the followers of Rosmini, of Drexel, Blondel, Deschardins, Pius Parch, Oda Cassells, and Gerald Ellard. Pope Paul VI told those close to him that he wanted the Mass to more closely resemble the Calvinist worship service, as he had come to believe that in so doing, a great moment of evangelization would be forthcoming. In other words, after centuries of screaming that they had the answer to holiness, an answer different from that of Saints Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Robert Bellarmine, Duns Scotus, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and Pope Pius V and Pope St. Pius X, the progressivists finally got their way. And they have had their way now for the past 35 years. How is it working? How has the church fared across the past one-third of a century? Are the faithful holier? Has a great moment of evangelization converted the Protestants as Pope Paul VI anticipated? Were they right or wrong? On the 25th anniversary of the introduction of Pope Paul VI's new Mass, Pope John Paul II proposed that the Mass was a sign of the new springtime for the Church. Has the new springtime come to your parish? Does the Lex Orandi of the new Mass reflect the same Lex Credendi that was reflected by the old Mass? We have answered the questions we came here to answer, these are all questions which we will leave for you. And there is yet one more question. The great Father Faber proposed that we must remember that if all the manifestly good men were on one side and all the manifestly bad men on the other, there would be no danger of anyone, least of all the elect, being deceived by lying wonders. It is the good men, good once, we must hope good still, who are to do the work of Antichrist and so sadly crucify the Lord afresh. This deceitfulness arises from good men being on the wrong side. So the question is, which side is the wrong side? We have attempted to provide this information as honestly and as even-handedly as possible. Do with it what you will. And the next time someone tells you that the new Mass was the brainchild of the Second Vatican Council, you might respond, I'd like to tell you a story. <laughs>